Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to my kitchen here at Return Refuge Farm. I'm so glad you're here. If you're new here, my name is Jess and this is the second video in a series that I'm currently working on called the From Scratch Kitchen where we're talking all about cooking from scratch. Before you click off of here, before you decide, oh, this video is not for me, I'm not interested, just give me two minutes, please. And I very, very rarely ask for that. I started this series by making a video all about kitchen tools. And as I begin to gather different recipes that I wanna cover and talk to different people about some collaborative efforts and kind of decided how in the world do I outline this? How do I take a person into the journey of learning to cook from scratch? Um, I kind of kept hitting up against a wall. Now. The reason why I'm asking for two minutes before you decide not to listen to this is because one, either you don't need to listen to it because you're well beyond this, you know how to cook from scratch and this is not um, applicable to you. In which case, you know, maybe stick around. You might have some information to share in the comment section. But really the people who say, I don't cook, I don't like cooking, I don't know how to cook, I can't even boil an egg, like the people who automatically discount themselves, I'm making this video for you. Um, I think that it is very important for people to learn how to cook. If you have the desire to homestead, you need to do this. You need to learn how to cook. Because on farms, um, what grows are ingredients. Uh, it's all just ingredients. So if you don't have some joy in the kitchen or desire to be in the kitchen, you're gonna get a little lost when all of this stuff starts coming in. I mean, yeah, you could make some salsa, I guess, and you know, make a couple of different things and eat tomato sandwiches and eat things as they come, but you're just gonna have a hard time getting through all of the food that comes on a farm if you don't learn how to cook from scratch. The other thing is, is that right now, food prices are going through the roof. We're dealing with inflation that is absolutely uh, crippling to a lot of people. I mean, just going in the grocery store, there are a lot of things that I'm buying now that I was literally paying half the price for just a year or two ago. And across the board, I have noticed on the food that I buy, it's gone up at least 20 to 30%. And for a lot of people who are dependent on convenience foods, that's how they know how to feed their family, uh, is those convenience foods, the prices just go up and up. People are ultimately gonna end up buying less food or lower quality food in order to be able to afford to feed themselves and their family. And I think the repercussions of that could be very, very long lasting, even generationally, whenever we look at the health uh, results of eating food that's not nutritious for you. So learning to cook from scratch really empowers you because it allows you to grow your food and know what to do with it. Um, it allows you to localize your food sources so you can go to farmer's markets and stuff and buy ingredients and know what to do with them. It allows you to preserve food out of season if you are getting a large harvest or if you have access to something um, and know what to do with it later. And even if all you ever do is buy food from the grocery store, it allows you to buy ingredients in bulk and be able to get a lot more for your money rather than buying convenience foods. I don't like it whenever people say, I can't cook, as if that's a, an, an actual identified trait that they have. Like I'm five foot five inches tall and I can't cook. No, you can't change your height, but you can learn how to do something. I'm terrible at cutting hair. It's not who I am as a person. I've just never learned. Uh, and when it comes to cooking, when people are like, I just don't like cooking, I don't like doing things that I'm bad at either. But as you choose to invest the time and energy into learning and taking joy in something and taking joy in the result in it, you can also grow in joy. I like eating. I don't always like like cooking but I always like eating and so that's kind of a motivator for me it's why I like reading cookbooks and staying motivated because I can read different things and I'm like oh that sounds really good I would like to make that and the only way to get it on the table is to cook it I think there is a choice that has to be made and I think that at the current point that we're all at I think it's one that's very worthy to be made another thing that I can say in defense of cooking from scratch is that many of you are here because you desire to homestead. You desire to garden. You're starting to do those things. And I like to say turn your waiting room into a classroom because if you have a dream and you are hoping for the fulfillment of that dream, 
Um, and all you do in the waiting period is you just sit and twiddle your thumbs. When you finally have the opportunity to have that dream, you won't know what to do with it. And uh, you will waste your time fumbling through all of the lessons that many of which you could have learned in the waiting room. Many people do not have access to a garden spot. They do not have access to land to start farming. They can't have chickens. They are not able to do the thing that they want to do, but you probably have a kitchen or you probably have access to a kitchen. So learning those skills while you wait to grow your food is saying, I'm going to learn what to do with ingredients because when I start growing food, that's what I'm going to grow. I learned to can on foraged blackberries long before before I had a farm, I learned from scratch cooking while I was in that waiting period. And because of that, when the ingredients started rolling in for my farm, um, I wasn't burning them. I wasn't ruining them. I was turning them into delicious food that we all enjoyed eating. I'm gonna lay a very basic groundwork on eating real food and things that you can apply where you are as we start this from scratch cooking journey. I want to make very clear, I, if you are a person that has been eating real food and cooking from scratch, I welcome your wisdom and your advice in the comment section. It is very, very important, I think, in community for people who have the capacity to mentor to do that. It's very important to share your wisdom, to share your recipes, to give people inspiration from the stories that you have. What I wanna make very clear is not welcome is um, the evangelism of your food opinions, which is to say, this is not the place to make condemning comments um, against people who eat meat or people who eat leafy greens or people, you know, there are arguments for veganism and paleo and keto and carnivore and AIP and gaps and all the different diets that we could say a person person should start on. Um, I have, I've, I've done the gamut. I have been vegan. I have been vegetarian. I have done carnivore. I have literally gone from one end of the spectrum to the other. And what I think that we should be able to agree on in common ground is that people are different. People respond to things differently. And that the number one most important thing that we can agree on as far as eating food is that real food that is not processed is better period. Whether it's largely plants or largely meat or whatever way you're going about it, there are certain things that I think that we can all agree on. And if you found something that works great for you, I understand the urge to share that with people. Uh, but I also think that we have to identify the fact that we have an entire generation of people that maybe have never experienced a real food and from scratch kitchen and that way of doing things ever, uh, that were raised on convenience foods that have only ever learned convenience foods, and maybe they have a desire to make a change, but every time they kind of curiously peek into the world of cooking and, and from scratch and health and all of that stuff, the opinions are so loud and conflicting that it can easily overwhelm a person who doesn't quite have their bearing on what's true or not, and therefore they retreat and they go back to what they know. And what I really wanna do is avoid being a place of overwhelming, impossible information that a new person doesn't know how to process. So that's why I'm saying like, hey, let's leave the, the diet evangelism out of the comment section um, and let's just stick to the grounds of let's, in, let's teach people and empower them how to eat real food. So one of the things that I think is very important on the front end as you start cooking from scratch is that food is not good or bad. And it's something that has really helped our family have a healthier approach to what we eat. Because when condemnation gets tied into food, um, it can just convolute how we see things. Food is, is not good food or bad food, okay? It's all fuel. Whatever you put in your body has different makeups of carbohydrates and proteins and calories, and it's going to affect your body depending on what's in it. If you look at it as that's good food or that's bad food or that's healthy food and that's unhealthy food, um, again, you can get into that tangly, overwhelmed place. I like to look at it as that is nutritious food or it's not. And it either tastes good or it doesn't. There are things that make me enjoy it more. There are things that make it easier to prepare. Um, there are all of these different factors that go in, 
but it is ultimately fuel that thankfully can be enjoyable. And unfortunately, because of the way that food is handled in our culture, man, a lot of us have just, we have very unhealthy relationships with food. And that's not a condemning thing. Recognizing that says, okay, I just wanna make it have a healthier relationship. So I think viewing food as fuel and honestly assessing how it fuels you is very important. So how something tastes can't be the number one um, reason why we eat it. Um, how something fuels us should be heavily considered, but unfortunately a lot of times people say, oh, it doesn't matter, it's just fuel, and they act like we're not gonna be motivated by how something tastes. I want to have food that fuels and nourishes us well and also tastes good, and I believe that that's actually very possible. So setting our goal, when we look at food, we look at what we wanna cook, what we wanna grow, how we wanna source it, you know, what our budget is, all of those things. I just like to say my goal is to, for us to eat mostly nourishing food that mostly tastes good. And whenever I have that standard set, my decisions can come up underneath that standard. So this is the unmovable standard. When it comes to food, I want to eat mostly nourishing food that fuels my body well and supports my body that mostly tastes good. Occasionally, I eat things that I'm, I'm not crazy about. Eh, that's okay. It's not most of the time. It's occasionally. Um, and occasionally, I eat things that are definitely not nourishing and definitely not for the sake of fueling my body. They're purely because I think they taste really good. But it's not all the time. It's occasionally. Mostly, I am eating food that nourishes my body well and tastes good. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about just the baseline of how I like to do food for my home. There are some things that I um, am pretty militant about avoiding, as well as just some general standards that I like to go for. Again, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just a mom that has been cooking from scratch for most of her adult life, and that feeds five hungry boys on the regular and does it pretty well. Um, I, I really enjoy food. I like cooking. We grow a lot of our food, and therefore I have to know what to do with the ingredients. Um, we haven't always towed this line well. I mean, there have been times that, you know, we've slid off into convenience foods, and, and then I'll, we'll get to a point that I'm like, wait a second, this isn't by the standard that we live by. We've gone more into convenience and this is not as nourishing as I want it to be. And so we'll pull it back in, you know? And I think that that's the journey of doing anything better is that we're always growing towards something. And so I actually discourage people whenever we start talking about cooking from scratch and maybe you haven't, and this is very new to you, I'm gonna discourage like jumping off into a challenge of like, if you have to go throw away half the food in your pantry, don't do that. Food is too expensive to be throwing away half the food in the pantry. Uh, my, my thing is let's do a sustainable mindset change and let's begin applying it one step at a time until one day you look up and you go, wow, we're so much further down this road than we were when we first started. That's what I think is healthy and good. And that's been my experience. So when you go in the grocery store, Typically, you're walking in and the produce section is right up there by the front. And the number one tip that I can give a person who is trying to get away from convenience foods and more into eating whole foods and real food is to shop the parameter of the grocery store. So typically in a grocery store, the produce and the coolers are around the edges. And then maybe you've got kind of a frozen section there, which may have some real food in it. Um, because of the fact that the nature of real food is that it is perishable because it has not been preserved and processed to a point that it can be shelf stable, you are going to be more sticking to the idea of eating food in the form that it comes in by shopping the perishable area. And so that is kind of the number one thing that will show you how much you are relying on convenience foods. Because whenever you're going into those aisles to get all of the processed stuff, usually if it's in those aisles, you could make it from the ingredients that are out on the parameter. So shopping the parameter of the grocery store is a, is a really good place to start, or at least start noticing where you're not doing that. Um, the second thing is to start reading ingredient labels. My rule of thumb, and like I said, I do not adhere to this entirely. This is a mostly thing. 
I don't like buying things that have more than five ingredients on the label. There are exceptions to that where they have more, they have more than five ingredients, but they're all whole food ingredients. If it has anything that I can't pronounce, in my mind, that's not real food. If it has any sort of like chemicals or processed ingredients that are so far from their original form that they're then given a whole new name, um, I don't want to buy that. If you ha are getting something, let's say that does have a long ingredients list, a lot of times those are things that can be easily made in a from scratch option. So let's use a uh, chili packages. Let's talk about a seasoning mix. Um, if you buy a package of chili seasoning, it's going to have all of the basic things that are in chili seasoning, like cumin and chili powder and whatever herbs and paprika or whatever the spices and herbs are in that. But it's also going to have anti-caking agents. It's going to have things like maltodextrin, which is actually a derivative of corn. And in a lot of cases, if you're buying something like that and it isn't non-GMO, that's GMO corn. Um, a, a lot of times you have a lot of stuff in there that if you were just going to make chili and use seasonings, you would never put, you know, maltodextrin in your chili. So you're eating those processed convenience things because they have to put those in in order to make that chili powder where it doesn't cake up. That's the kind of thing that if you are routinely buying, you can make a small shift to eliminate those extra ingredients. Another example that a lot of people don't realize is um, you can buy a block of cheese and shred it yourself. If you buy already shredded cheese, it is coated in an anti-caking agent. So if you read that label, you're going to see some sort of additive that's in that. And it's actually some sort of pulp that is actually a derivative from wood. It's made from wood, um, at least the last time I checked. I don't know if that might have recently changed, but I remember being appalled when I learned that, that I was like, wow. And you think about eating all of those little things, especially if you're eating it everywhere, if you're putting meals together and every single element that goes in that meal has some sort of anti-caking, anti-this, or different agents and preservatives in it, and then you're eating that, how is that affecting your gut health? How is that affecting your digestive system? How's, you know, my son Jackson has a corn allergy, so I couldn't cook with that because the maltodextrin would make his skin break out and make him have a hard time breathing. And that, to me, is where we make these little steps towards better. And we learn where do I want to actually use convenience foods because it is that much more convenient. And then reading the labels and saying, I'm gonna buy something that's high enough quality that I'm not compromising on what I'm eating. So learning to read the ingredient labels and going ahead and crossing out things that have lots and lots of ingredients, especially ones that you can't pronounce, is a really good way to make a step towards cooking from scratch. Like right now, go look in your pantry, go look in your fridge, and pull out the things that you are buying that are already prepared. And that I'm talking just everything. Um, look at it, read the ingredients, and think, how hard would it be to make this from scratch? So for instance, if you're buying the boxes with the little oatmeal packets. Um, those make zero economic sense in my house. I looked, I, I was just, I was thinking about this video the other day when I was at the store and just the bottom cheap version of the oatmeal packets, not organic, not anything fancy, just the peaches and cream store brand was like $3 for eight packets. And I think one of those packages makes like less than a cup of oatmeal prepared. My kids could decimate that whole box for breakfast one morning. My boys could do that. They could probably eat that whole box and need something else to go with it, with some fruit, maybe grabbing some yogurt also, and that would be a solid breakfast. So just the oatmeal wouldn't be enough. Now for the same $3, you can get a can of quick oats that has 24 servings in it or 30 servings. For $4, you could get the 30 serving can of organic quick oats. Um, if you decided that you wanted to buy bulk, you could go from somewhere like Azure Standard, which is what I do, and you can get the really big bags of oats. Um, and you could even get quick oats, which would cook faster. 
for you know ten dollars and get 60 servings or whatever it is i don't know exactly what the price is right now on those things but i'm saying if you are using a lot of this stuff you can buy it bulk and ultimately my kids if they are eating something like oatmeal they're eating organic oatmeal that i can buy a higher quality product and that i can let them eat to their little heart's desires so that they're actually full it does not have any additional agents added to it. It doesn't have any sugar added to it, so we can sweeten it with something like honey and put our own butter or cream in it. But we've now gone from a highly processed food to a whole food, and it's costing less. And that's where I'm really wanting people to look at what they're buying and think, what would be the equivalent of doing this from scratch? And that's not even talking about cooking meals. I think that the best place to start when you're saying I want to eliminate convenience foods and I want to start cooking from the ingredients that someday I hope to grow or source in a more homesteady way is to look at all of those little things. We're not even talking about what you're cooking for dinner. That is probably enough for a lot of people to get along with. Um, there are a lot of examples that I could give on this, but I think that looking at where you're doing pre prepared things, breads are a good place to look. That's a good place to start from scratch. Um, things like breakfasts is a good place that you can say, what can I, can I place out for scra from scratch? Seasoning mixes is a big one. A lot of people are just in the habit of buying seasoning mixes and they're ultimately overpaying and consuming preservatives and additives that they otherwise wouldn't need to. Buying things more in an original form. So think cheese, buying it in a block instead of shredding. You are giving up a little bit of convenience, but often you're saving money, um, sometimes pretty significantly so, and you're eliminating those additives and different agents that are added to the more convenient product. Now there are some things that I absolutely limit in what I buy. And I'll tell you just on a personal note, I started reading food labels when I was 21. So I've been doing this like most of my adult life because my son Asher had a severe dairy allergy. In order to nurse him, I had to read labels and learn what all of that stuff meant. This is when my eyes were open. And since I started learning about food when Asher was a baby, um, I have had multiple times that I've kind of had to revisit things. Like Jackson was diagnosed with a corn allergy just within the last year. He was having all of these skin issues and these breathing issues, and we found out that it was caused by corn. And when that diagnosis came, it was kind of the talk was, well, he's going to need allergy shots and all these different things because corn is almost impossible to eliminate out of a diet. Now, thankfully for us, we already eat very clean. We already eat whole foods. And so for us, it, the areas where he was consuming corn were obvious. He was eating popcorn when he was eating corn tortillas. Uh, but he wasn't eating a whole lot of things that had, you know, cornstarch and maltodextrin and all the different corn byproducts that could end up in food. And so we were able to eliminate that again, but it took me back to reading labels again. It was just a refresher again about how important this is. And then we went gluten-free. And it's very easy when you're thinking, okay, gluten-free becomes the standard that you're buying food by. Well, there's a ton of food that is gluten-free that is so full of stuff that I can't pronounce. And I found myself wanting to buy that stuff because I allowed my standard to become gluten-free. And I had to stop and be like, wait a second, I don't want to start buying processed foods. We don't eat processed foods. My standard is to eat food that nourishes us well and mostly tastes good. Like that is my standard, not gluten-free. So the gluten-free comes underneath that. And ultimately it led me back to the fact that we can eat lots of food that doesn't have gluten in it without having to buy a whole lot of specific gluten-free products. Again, it's very important to set your standard, to read your labels, and to know what you're not going to budge on. So the other things that I'm looking for whenever I'm looking at food labels is I do not like to buy seed oils. So seed oils are things like canola oil or grape seed oil. Um, now canola, people are learning so much about canola oil. Canola oil is actually rapeseed oil and they branded it as canola oil because obviously some people would take issue with rapeseed oil. But now I've been noticing rapeseed oil showing up on ingredient lists uh, because I guess people are realizing that canola oil is often, you know, it's, it's not good for you. 
And I'm like, wow, man, that's getting pretty rough if they're kind of reverting back on their original marketing. Um, but yes, rapeseed canola is the same thing. Uh, grapeseed, sunflower oil, that's a big one, unfortunately. That is in a lot of convenience health food. Like a lot of brands of things that are being marketed as health foods and they have the price tags to match them have sunflower oil in them. And in my research and what I have decided, I am uncomfortable with consuming um, seed oils really at all, but completely cutting those out is extremely difficult. Um, but eating whole foods is really the best way to do that. Uh, we largely use animal fats, lards and tallows, as well as uh, butter, avocado oil, and we do use olive oil, though it's not the number one oil that we use. We typically lean to the other things and then use olive oil more as a seasoning rather than you know, our primary cooking oils. So when I'm reading ingredients, I'm looking for the seed oils. I'm looking for any sort of added sugar. Uh, unfortunately, sugar is very, very inflammatory and I am not anti-sugar. I'm not anti-sweet. I, I like sweets. I think that we eat so much added sugar that a lot of times we miss out on how wonderful food is all on its own. Uh, so by cutting out refined sugars, I i mean, I can eat a sweet potato as it is and think it's amazing. I, I eat dried pineapple strips like they are the biggest treat in the world because they taste super sweet to me because I'm not eating a lot of refined sugars. And there is so much added sugars in food that a lot of people consume way more sugar than they realize. So I think looking for that and just being aware of where you are buying added sugar. I don't buy things that have, of course, by limiting seed oils, this kind of cuts this out, but I don't buy anything that has hydrogenated oils in it uh, just because your body has a really hard time processing that. And I don't buy anything with obviously any sort of like corn sweetener. So like corn syrup or anything like that. Of course, buy trying to limit any sort of refined and added sugars, that obviously is gonna knock that off the list. By cutting out a lot of that stuff, it's going to force you to go back to what I was saying, looking at things and saying, could I make this from scratch? Because a lot of bread products that you can buy, they've got that stuff in them. A lot of jarred sauces that you can buy, they have that stuff in them. A lot of um, packaged, salad dressings. They've got that stuff in it. And whenever you say, okay, in my standard of wanting nourishing food, these ingredients are not the most nourishing options and therefore I want to avoid them largely, not all the time. It doesn't have to be black and white. We're looking for a majority rule here. By saying I'm going to avoid them, then you're looking at the salad dressing options and all of a sudden 90% of what's on the shelf is no longer going to uphold to your standard. And then what you learn is, oh, I could get some good vinegar and some good olive oil and some herbs and some spices and I could mix up a really nice salad dressing all on my own. And instead of paying $5 for the natural salad dressing that doesn't have the cruddy oils in it, take 45 cents worth of ingredients and you make your salad dressing and you've knocked another thing off of your list. You've brought your grocery budget down and you're one step closer to eating from scratch. Right now, I hope that this is empowering and not overwhelming, but I want you to take these things and say, this is what I'm gonna approach food. And instead of maybe doing it in the grocery store, start looking in your pantry, start looking in your fridge. You don't have to throw those things away. Get through them, and when that salad dressing is gone, or when that sauce is gone, or whenever you know that bread is gone, that's when you start thinking about, am I ready to replace this with something that is from scratch? And maybe you're not on everything. That's why I don't like those challenges that make you throw everything away, because I don't think that it's sustainable to make 100% of change at one time. That's way too overwhelming. And many of us are using these convenience foods because we're busy and I don't want you to fail. So knock the things off the list that you can, you know, one step at a time as things run out, start looking for a way to replace them. Uh, the last thing, and that's where I really wanted to dive in to this series, is because I want to show you different things about making the salad dressings and the breads and the sauces, is that for me, eating real food is easiest whenever we're eating simple foods that are prepared to taste good. 
Um, I like cooking elaborate dinners. I like making things that take a really long time. But I would say more often than not, what dinner looks like for us is a roast chicken and some roasted potato, potatoes and some roasted vegetables um, or a quick salad that we picked. It's going to be very simply prepared. I am not trying to transform our food all the time. I'm trying to nourish us in a way that mostly tastes good. And so I believe that if you are trying to learn to cook from scratch and what you immediately do is you go get all of these elaborate recipe books and it's all of these things that require tons of prep work and two hours of cooking for dinner, if you have the time and capacity to do that, more power to you. I don't, and I don't know a lot of people who do, especially that are raising families. Start with the realization of what you are buying. Start with the realization of how simply those things can be replaced with a from scratch alternative. Decide where your conveniences are most worth it. I make mayonnaise. Um, it's super easy to make from scratch. I have the eggs. We use, you know, I usually use avocado oil, make some mayonnaise. It's, it's very simple. We don't use mayonnaise all the time. I keep it made in the summer when making tomato sandwiches, but you know, I don't have any mayonnaise made in the fridge right now. Um, I don't make ketchup. Making ketchup is way more extensive. And so I found a brand of ketchup that doesn't have a whole bunch of added sugars and I buy that. So that's where I'm saying like, you have to choose what conveniences work for you. We do the oatmeal from scratch. We cook it on the stove top. We add in our own butter and honey or maple. Um, I do not buy packages of oatmeal. I actually still buy some cereals because my kids really, really like it. And whereas I think that it's overpriced for a box of grain to cost that much. I don't think that it should. Um, I can buy a high quality product that I'm okay with my kids eating and I can make that concession for them because I don't want to teach them that you know certain foods are bad. I wanna teach them that mostly we wanna nourish ourselves and taste good, but occasionally it's okay to eat something that you enjoy eating and that you like even if it isn't the most nourishing thing. So I still buy cereals sometimes. I don't buy a lot and I don't let my kids eat cereal every morning because it's not super nourishing and it would be really expensive to do that. So again, I want you to really feel out the reality of your food situation. And maybe think about the things that you are regularly consuming, your family is regularly consuming that are not super nourishing. Maybe you're a soda drinker. Maybe you love that creamer in your coffee that is full of oils and sugar. Um, and maybe you're not ready to give that up yet. That's okay. I'm, I'm not here to take away your coffee creamer. I will tell you, you can get half and half and add maple syrup and some vanilla to it and make a really tasty coffee creamer that doesn't have oils and refined sugars in it. And maybe you're ready to make that step, but maybe you're not. And I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to say, set the standard that you wanna eat mostly nourishing food that mostly tastes good. And assess where you are. As we jump into this cooking from scratch series, that's really what I need. I feel like you will get the most from it if that's what you've done. If you've honestly assessed where you are, you've assessed the things that you're wanting to make exceptions on, you've assessed the things that you could easily change to make a step in the right direction, and then you can start learning those simple ways to eat real food. And I really think that if you will make this assessment, you will have the honest look at it and see where you can make those little changes that you could look back a year from now and say, wow, I'm cooking so much more from scratch. I feel so much more able to uh, obtain that homesteading dream. Or maybe you've already started the homestead and you're going, wow, I'm using my stuff way more efficiently than I was before. Uh, but that's, that's where I would say this video is for. Eat real food. Try to stick to that as much as possible. And let's make some... Let's draw some lines in the sand of things that we mostly want to avoid. The things that are m really not nourishing for us that maybe um, really aren't lending to us being our healthiest self. And in the meantime, I think that there's potential here to live in a lot more freedom and maybe save a good deal of money as things start to get more expensive. I hope this helped you guys. It's a hard topic to talk about um, because there are so many opinions. And I don't always feel qualified to talk about it because I haven't always, I'm, I'm not the example of being the most um, disciplined from scratch cook and doing everything super ideally. Um, but 
I do feel confident what I've told you today is something that will make your life richer. Thank you guys. I look forward to continue sharing more with you on this topic and hopefully help you along in your journey of learning to cook from scratch. I bless you. Until next time.